The Penguins got some great injury updates during practice on Friday. And to start off today's show, we're going to get into what those updates were, plus get you set for the Penguins-Blues matchup on Saturday night. Your Locked On Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Hunter Hodes. You can follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Joining me as always is my co-host Patrick Dam. You can follow him on Twitter at Send for Wet. And you can follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins, of course. Thank you all so much for making this your first listen slash watch of the day. So not a game night tonight for the Penguins. They play on Saturday night against the St. Louis Blues. In St. Louis, that's a city I've always wanted to go to. I just won't go to a, a Cardinals game because I can't stand the Cardinals. But their hockey arena looks really nice when the Penguins always play there. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, some really good injury updates for the Penguins. And, I mean, it looked like it wasn't going to be good on Thursday, but both Chris Letang and Noah Chari were back at practice on Friday after missing practice on Thursday. Letang was back in his usual spot on the top pair alongside Ryan Graves. Noel Chari was back in his usual spot on the fourth line with Matt Nieto and Jeff Carter. Achari spoke to the media after, said he should be good to go for the game, but Latang wasn't as confident. He said he's kind of a maybe at this point. Mike Sullivan kind of echoed the same thing. He's not going to go out and say that he's going to play. He's going to do his usual game time decision stuff. I'm sure he'll say that after the morning skate on Saturday, but at the very least, Pat, it looks like these are two injuries that are very minor. And if Latang has to miss a game, it's not going to be the end of the world, but they, it looks like they've avoided anything serious here. Yeah. The one thing that worried me is when Sullivan was asked about it yesterday and when he goes very vague about it and just says, Oh, he's being evaluated for blah, 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 blah. That usually indicates they're going to be out for a while. Cause that's kind right. of been his MO that's been his tell with injuries over the years is when he tells you they're being evaluated for a lower body injury or an upper body injury. Usually in the next day or two after that, we hear this player is going to be a week to week with whatever, and we won't see him for a couple weeks. So I was fully prepared for the worst when he said that. So waking up today and then seeing that both of them were at practice in full capacity, who breath of fresh air. Agreed. And I tried to go back and find when Chris Letang got hurt. I really couldn't find it because he played the entire game. He, he was able to finish off that game. And usually it's funny in typical Penguins fashion. Usually when a player is out longer term, as Mike Sullivan likes to say that it's after that Penguin player finishes the game with that injury. And then, Oh, you're going to be out for the next several weeks. That's happened numerous times. I feel like in the Mike Sullivan era, I think it's honestly happened in the Dan Biles, my era as well. It's just happened quite often throughout the Sidney Crosby, Vinnie Malkin, Crystal Tang era. I'm glad that it looks like it's not going to happen with these two cases, at least. <laughs> yeah, and I'm with you. I went back to kind of look at when maybe Chris Letang would have been hurt, and I saw some speculation that it was after the penalty shot call when he kind of dove to mm -hmm. go for a uh, cop, but – yeah, like people said he was wincing on the bench after that, and it looked like he may have tweaked something. So that was really about the only moment I could see where he may have gotten hurt. So maybe he just outstretched something and just needed a day, and just maybe it wasn't really an injury so much as just like, hey, take the day off and you know get whatever you stretched too far looked at, make sure it's nothing bad, and probably got looked at, and the doctors said, hey, that's all right, just take it easy today. We'll see you tomorrow. Right, and if he does have to miss the game on Saturday, it's not the end of the world. I would expect him back for the Penguins next game. After that, you know, the schedule is going to start getting at least, you know, a little bit tougher with some games coming up. But that's all good news. But it looks like we may see a little bit of a different lineup against the Blues on Saturday. Though if Crystal Tang plays and Noah Trey plays, that'll be great. But in terms of the bottom pairing, it looks like Mike Sullivan is closing in on some changes to that pairing. Based on practice on Friday... P.O. Joseph would be the odd man out, and Ryan Shea would make his Penguins debut. I disagree with that. I think Chad Ruedel should be the odd man out, considering his play 
against the Red Wings. I don't like how he, again, stood right in front of Tristan Jari and basically impeded his ability to see the Ben Sherratt shot. I also didn't like his play on the penalty kill where the Red Wings scored in, what was it, 20, 25 seconds? He was, all, again, standing right in front of Tristan Jari, not letting him do his job. He was directly responsible for more goals in that game than P.O. Joseph was. And I understand P.O. Joseph didn't make the play on that pass from Zarnik. I, I thought the play from Ruido along the boards was fine. We talked about it on Thursday. Usually that's a bounce that Ruido gets. He didn't. I still wanted to see Joseph make that play with his stick. I think if he's able to move his stick a little further up, that puck gets deflected off his stick. It goes back the other way. The Red Wings don't tie the game. Who knows what happens after that? But I don't like that he's sitting just because of one mistake. I think this is the typical, and, and if this happens, I think this is the typical, oh, I'm going to go with the veteran over the younger player, which any coach does this in the NHL. It's not just a Mike Sullivan thing, but it's still super frustrating when it looks like this is going to happen again during the Sullivan era. And again, I know it happens to every team that has veteran coaches, but it's super annoying that it's going to happen here, it looks like. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me, honestly. I mean, I don't even really see why you're bothering with changing the bottom bottom pairing at all right now. I said it yesterday. It's four games in, and especially in the second period against Detroit, nobody looked good. It, there, Everybody was a culprit in the second period. You could... It was a matter of who sucked less in the second period rather than who was good. And we talked about it. So far this season, in limited time, the third pairing's been somewhere between perfectly fine and good. Like, So I don't really see the need to switch up this third pairing just yet. I understand they want to get Ryan Chase in playing time. He's been good enough throughout the preseason and training camp that I think the fact that they're keeping him around this long shows they want to give him a look. And... I'd say considering in the limited amount of opportunities he's had as a bottom pairing guy, he's earned it because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a guy they sought out. They went out and got, they gave him a look. He clearly did well enough for them to like him. So I get that they want to give him a chance, but I just don't feel like it's time yet because yeah, uh, Wednesday was bad. Wednesday was a bad game all around top to bottom in the, especially in the second period. So I don't see the need to switch the third pairing. If nothing else, I'm looking more at the bottom six than I am the third pair. And we'll get to the bottom six in a little bit later on in the show. But I agree with you. And if you want to make a change to the third pairing, you can also just take out both guys and you can maybe give Ryan Shea and John Lovevick a chance if you want to do that. I don't think taking one of them out, especially in this case, P.O. Josephs, is going to make that much of a difference. Heading into that game against the Red Wings, that third pairing had an expected goals for percentage of 70%. That's pretty good. Last I checked, all their underlying numbers, their shot attempts for 60 minutes was well above 50%. Their scoring chances for per 60 minutes above 50%. You can't just let one game be like, oh, I'm going to throw this into a blender and all that good stuff, and especially taking out the player who I think was not as bad as the other player. And while I do get that Ruido is going to be in the lineup because of his penalty killing ability, I know Joseph is not on the PK, I don't think that alone should be enough to keep him in after the mistakes that he made over a younger player in Joseph who is still trying to find his way in the NHL. I will say on the opposite end of that, I can kind of see the justification for taking POJ out because he did fade pretty heavily as the season continued last year. That's true. So maybe they do want to limit his time a little bit just to keep him from fading again. To whereas maybe you limit him early in the season, you know, don't have him play every single night early on the first couple of months, and then down the stretch, you put him in the lineup consistently. But at the same time, what we all wanted to see out of POJ this year was to take that next step and become a full-time, you know, 75 to 82 game defenseman should he remain healthy. So I, I can kind of understand it, but that doesn't mean I agree with it. My thing with that is keep that same energy, though, for other veteran players in the lineup. And I'm not trying to compare the positions here. But, for example, Jeff Carter. He's already been not that good this year. Keep that same energy with him, even though he makes a little bit more money, even though he's on the final year of his contract. He can't play a full 82 games. So is he going to get a free pass? 
from Mike Sullivan and this coaching staff. I, I don't know. Some of this, I guess, doesn't make that much sense to me. And I just want it to be fully fair, I think is what I'm trying to say. But I think that will do it for this first segment of this episode. Coming up in the second segment, Pat and I are going to get you all settled for Penguins Blues on Saturday night. And this is a game, in my opinion, that the Penguins should definitely win. The Blues do not look like a good team this year. But before we get to that, we got to tell you all about the Jace case. It's a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. Jace Medical now offers customizability for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications. You can choose the medications that best fit you and your family's unique needs. Go to jacemedical.com and enter code locked on at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code locked on at J A S E medical.com. And we're not done. We still got to tell you all about bird dogs. They stretch khaki shorts and they are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. They also fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. And they also fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. I absolutely love my bird dogs. I wear these about two or three times a week. Heck, you really only need to wash them a couple times a month because they don't really get dirty that easily. And if you want to get your hands on yours, all you got to do is go to birddogs.com slash locked on NHL or enter promo code locked on NHL at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NHL for a free water bottle at checkout. You will not want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that. All right, we're back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm Hunter Hodes, joined by my co-host Patrick Dam. Of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen slash watch of the day. So, Penguins Blues, Saturday night in St. Louis, the gateway of the West, whatever you want to call that amazing city that I definitely do want to visit. But this Blues team, not good, to say the least. They just got blown out by the Arizona Coyotes on home ice. And, you know, that's a Coyotes team that I do think is going to be a bit better this year. But the Blues did not look good in that game. They were without Pavel Buchnevich, one of their best offensive players. He was really good for the Blues last year. Second overall in points at 26 goals, 67 points in 63 games. And, you know, shout out to the New York Rangers for that awful trade by sending Buchnevich (laughs) to the Blues, get him out of the Metropolitan Division. That's for sure. He's kind of a game time decision right now. Craig Rube said on Friday that, they're hoping he can come out for the morning skate, see what he can do. But if not, he will not play, which if he doesn't, that's a big break for the Penguins. The Blues, they do have some talent up front. I mean, Jordan Cairo, very good player. He was good for them last year. 37 goals, 73 points. His 37 goals led the team. Robert Thomas, 65 points last year. Much better playmaker last year compared to in other years. Braden Shen, who always gets under Sidney Crosby's skin or has in the past. You, you remember those days back when he oh, was. Oh, I player. sure do. Oh, I sure do. Sid did not like him. There's only a few players in this league that Crosby does not like, I think. Braden Shen is one of them. He would go He's after on the him list. all the time. <laughs> but again, up and down this Blues lineup, they do have some offensive ability. They traded for Kevin Hayes during the offseason. Jacob Verona It's had a really nice start of the year, by the way. One goal, three points in their first two games. Defensively, though, this is where the Penguins, I think, can cook. The Blues were one of the worst defensive teams in the league last year, finished 26th, 27th in that range in terms of expected goals against per 60 minutes, scoring chances against per 60 minutes, all, 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 any stat you want to put in there, they were one of the worst defensive teams in the league. And then you couple that with Jordan Bennington, who is not the goalie that he used to be, I think this is a game that the Penguins can definitely score quite a few goals. Now, Bennington did play well in the game in St. Louis last year. That was in game that went to overtime where the Penguins won in Bennington. I get, yeah, he did have one of his best games of the year during that one. But overall, this should be a game that the Penguins can win, even though you look at the Blues and their firepower up front, but defensively they're a wreck. Yeah, to build off what you're saying about them being a bad defensive team, this is a game that I look at for the Penguins, should they come in mostly healthy, as a get-right game. And now I understand it's only been three games for the Blues so far. But right now, they have the 31st worst power play. They have yet to score a power play goal. So this is a moment for the penalty kill to really get themselves into a groove. 
And then they have the 32nd ranked PK. So if this power play wants to feast, this is a game to do it. When you get your chances, this isn't even just one of those things where we're saying, don't be a net negative. Don't kill momentum. This is a game where you have to go out and score. Because clearly three games in, they don't know what they're doing on the PK yet. So you have to take advantage of that. With all of the talent you're rolling out on your first power play unit, this is a game where, again, I say it all the time, simplify the game. Move the puck, move your feet, get chances. Don't let Bennington see the puck. Especially because with a guy like Bennington, you know how he is when you get near his crease. Oh yeah, He does not have an even temperament. You can rattle this guy very easily. If you get an early power play and you put either Jake Gensel or Ricard Raquel right in front and just let them stand there and take a couple pokes at the puck, get in his way, maybe bump him a little bit as you're coming into the crease, it'll get him off his game. He's very much a hothead. And if he becomes more focused on the guy in front of him than stopping the puck, this is a night where the Penguins can put up a couple of power play goals should they get the opportunity. Let's be honest here. Jordan Bennington is a baby at the end of the day. That, that is what he is. We all saw how rattled he got when the, these two teams played in Pittsburgh last year. And Jason Zucker was just giving it to him from the bench when he was, when Bennington was going off the ice, it was hilarious to say the least, but you took the words right out of my mouth. When you said with Gensel and Raquel on the power play park Gensel right in front of Bennington and see what that guy does. Just watch how mad he'll get. He'll try to, Use his stick to just slash him, whatever. Just make sure he doesn't see the puck because if you get in his grill, he is going to get upset. That is how he is. And even at five on five outside of special teams, the Penguins should cook here. You look at this Blues defensive group. I'm sorry. It's not good. When you have Nick Letty on your top pairing, you are not a serious team. I'm sorry. Nick Letty, there was a time when he used to be a pretty good and reliable top four defenseman. He is not that anymore. Let's be real here. Colton Pareko, he can at least bring you some offense. Tory Krug is a power play specialist at this point in his career. He doesn't really do enough at five on five anymore. Still really good on the power play. Solid power play quarterback. Justin Falk can bring some offense. You got Marco Scandella in there as well. But overall, this should be a defensive group that the Penguins should punish. I look at this defensive group as a remember some guys defense. I love because that. Because Nick Letty... Toy Krug, Justin Falk, Marco Scandella, they were pretty good a handful of years ago. Pretty solid. And they're just not those guys anymore. So they're the guys that you talk about when you're talking hockey with your buddies and go, oh, dude, you remember you remember when the, uh, the, the Bruins made that run to the Stanley Cup and Tory Krug was a big part of it? Oh, man, you remember when the Blues won the Cup? Yeah, Colton Pareko, he was solid, right? Right? So, like – I don't mean to disrespect their careers because it's all I'm trying to do. These are guys who have put up some solid numbers in a solid NHL career, but these are very clearly guys who are on the back end of those careers. So like you said, this is a defense where at the very least the top six for the Penguins should do well to get some great a chances. And hopefully this is, hopefully this can be a jumping off point. Right. And I know again, it's early four games in, I'm not burying this team yet, but this is the kind of game where if you go out, you win by a couple of goals, you put up five or six, and it kind of puts that seed in your head of like, you know what? Yeah, we can do this, and especially next week because a lot of good teams coming to Pittsburgh next week. So this is a game where you want to come in firing on all cylinders and come out of it thinking, okay, big week coming up, two points in the bank. We're starting to feel ourselves a little bit. So this is – this is a fairly crucial game tomorrow night. And going off that, this hopefully can be the game where the bottom six wants to be like, hello, we're here too. We can also help out the goal scoring duties and take that pressure away from the top six. Because, you know, we just discussed that their defense is not good. You hope that someone in the bottom six, maybe it's Ro Connor, maybe even Jeff Carter, anyone in the bottom six can take advantage of that. And then going back to special teams for a second, Blues top power play, they can put out some serious talent on there. You know, Shen, Thomas, Kairu, Krug is still a really good power play quarterback. They do have Kasperi Kapan out on there. But they've had him out there for the first couple of games, which is kind of a little funny. But outside of that, they can put out some good forwards on their power play unit. So the Penguins PK is going to have to be really sound with that. And also, speaking of Kapanen, 
are we going to get a Kasperi Kapanen revenge game here? From yeah, him? probably. <laughs> uh, probably. I, mean, I, don't, I don't even go deep into it. Just that's how it always goes. It's been that way with him. It's been that way with Sprong. The, the last couple of guys that they've they've let go over the past five six years. They always they always manage to show up and do something big. Because let, let's be honest, it's a it's a it's a it's a consistently contending team in Pittsburgh. And if you get jettisoned from that team, it 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 stings a little bit. If you are a betting person, definitely maybe throw some money on an anytime goal scorer for Kasperi Kapanen. If you're using FanDuel, especially because in typical Penguins fashion, this stuff has happened before, and it's going to happen again in the future. It would not be surprising to see that happen for this game again for, against the Blues, and he's expected to play on the second line, especially if Bushnevich does not suit up for the Blues. But that will do it for this preview for the game against the Blues. Coming up in the final segment, it looks like the Penguins have the replacement for Jansen Harkins, and it's a player that Pat and I are both pretty excited about, to say the least. He should have made the team out of camp in preseason. I'll say that. But before we get to that, we got to tell you all about Sleeper, which is the official daily fantasy app of the Locked On NHL Network. Sleeper is our top choice for daily fantasy sports, especially daily fantasy hockey. With Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. And with studs like Connor McDavid, Alex Ovechkin, Sidney Crosby, Kale McCarr, Eric Carlson after the way he played on Wednesday night, all you need to do is basically pick stats. You can also use goalies like Igor Shostorkin, Ilya Sorokin, Connor Hellbuck. Choose these stats like goals, assists, saves. You can even throw plus minus in there if you want. And you heard me, Penguins fans. You can get 100 times payouts on sleepers. So start paying attention and get your picks right so you can win big. You can do this by yourself. You can do this with your friends. Or you can do this with your family if you want. Just use the promo code LOCKEDONNHL and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's Locked On NHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. All right, we're back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm Hunter Hodes, joined by my co-host Patrick Damp. So we have the Jansen Harkins replacement, and before we get to that, Jansen Harkins cleared waivers on Friday. He was reassigned to Wilkes-Barre. Got to say, I was a little surprised by that. I thought maybe the, the Jets would claim him back, assign him to their AHL affiliate, but that did not happen, or maybe even any team, I figured, could maybe give a waiver claim on him considering he's still at least young enough, but no team decided to do that. Were you surprised by any – Were excuse me, were you surprised by him clearing? A little bit. I figured there would be – if not Winnipeg, maybe one or two bottom barrel teams or teams in the middle that might take a shot on at him. Cause like you said, he's still relatively young. He's got some upside. He's not a bad little player, but you know, I, when they put him on waivers yesterday, I was fully ready to sit, see him get claimed by somebody. So kind of a little bit of more found money for the penguins, because if he goes down to a, the AHL and Wilkes bear and plays well, that's a guy you have waiting to come back up and hopefully make a difference. So it, it's a nice little advantage that they they were able to keep him in the organization. Right. And I'm glad that Kyle Dubas is working quickly to fix the issues in the bottom six. And with that, Redeem Zahorna called up for the first time this year. He will be taking Harkin's spot in the lineup, probably on the third line, if I had to guess, with Drew O'Connor and Lars Eller. Time to see what he can do. He had a great camp. He had a great preseason. If he can really get the bottom six going, that will go a long way for this team's success this year. And Hey, maybe some of that is a little unfair, just it, squarely it being on his shoulders for getting the bottom six going. But based on what we've seen, th this is a good player, and I'm excited to see what he can do against the Blues. I think this will help uh, Lars Eller as well, because now he's got two guy, two younger guys who can move, who are quick, takes a little bit of a burden off of him. He can be more of a floater in the offensive zone as well as be the first guy back into the – defensive zone which is kind of what they want him to do plus I really do think that not only was he the best Penguins player in the preseason and training camp he brings the energy that this bottom six really needs they need a shot in the arm they need a guy like Sahorna who's going to play fast who's going to play physical who's going to bring a little bit more sandpaper to that unit and we saw that all throughout the preseason he was playing very hard he was involved in everything whether it was going to the corners and throwing a hit on the four check and retrieving the puck, or if, you know, if, you know, he's getting some offensive opportunities, which 
as we know, there has been exactly one point between the guys who have played in the bottom six in the first four games, and it was an assist for Lars Eller. That needs to change ASAP for this bottom six if it wants to work this year, or you, or you will see more changes soon coming for it. But overall, yeah, I mean, I agree. I want to see him use that long reach of his. It's such a beautiful weapon. I, I'm excited to see what he can do also on the PK. He was being used a bit on the PK during camp and the preseason, and he was doing a pretty good job of it. So if the Penguins do take penalties on Saturday, I would expect him to be out there as well. But he gets the first crack at helping to fix this unit. If he is not able to get it done, I would assume he's going to go down to Wilkesbury in short order, and then someone like Colin White or Vinny Hinder shows it will come up. I don't expect him to have that long of a leash. That's just the reality of the situation here when you have a bottom six that is not producing a lot of offense. But you could also say the same for other players in this bottom six right now. Someone like Jeff Carter should not have that long of a leash. Someone maybe even like, dare I say, Matt Nieto should not have that long of a leash. He hasn't really done anything to start the year. Lars Eller, outside of taking penalties, I don't think he's done much to start the year. I just don't want a lot of these guys down there. And I know they brought in some new faces during the offseason. A few of them have multi-year contracts. I get it. But I don't want them to have such longer leashes over some of these younger guys when they're not really doing anything. But overall, Zahorna, excited to see what he can do. And, hey, if he's able to get this thing going, I'll be a happy man. I'll say that. For sure. And I took what you and I have talked about and what Kyle Dubas said and wrote about that for my column today on KDKA with Penguins Perspectives in that I think Kyle Dubas has made it clear that he's not just going to sit around. If the bottom six is struggling, as much as Kyle Dubas is a process guy, as much as he is a we're trying to do this one thing and we're going to give it time rather than immediately throwing it in the trash. He has made it clear that the Penguins' biggest problem, it was the problem last year, it's starting to look like a problem a little bit this year, is the bottom six. So he's not just going to sit there and tinker and look at things and go, ah, who knows? If he's going to ship some guys out, I think he's going to ship some guys out. And he's, he's said on record that he'll be aggressive on the waiver wire if he has to be as well. If that means putting a guy on waivers and losing them or picking up guys who find themselves on the waiver wire that could help in the bottom six, he's going to do it. So as much as we are worried about the bottom six right now, in a month, two months, three months, it's probably not going to look like it does right now. I agree. And I also think he's going to be pretty aggressive on the trade market if none of these in-house options work or if nothing on the waiver wire works either. Yes, the Penguins don't have basically any cap space right now. But there's always teams willing to help you out with that. I'll, I'll just you, say you, that. Can, I, I, you, you can, can go ahead. You can make cap space. It, yeah. It, it, this isn't the Ron Hextall era where there's going to be absolutely zero creativity. We saw him do this in Toronto for years. He has people around him who quite literally have no job other than to study the salary cap. So there will be creative moves. There will be things done that will be able to get around this lack of cap space. And with that, he won't hesitate to make a move from outside the organization to bring in here if this bottom of six continues to not be good. I mean, I threw the name out of Connor Garland yesterday just because he's on the market, and I'm sure there's quite a few teams in on him. He changes agency. The Canucks are willing to eat some money. Maybe you go there. I know it's probably a little bit unlikely right now just because the Penguins have no cap space, but as we just discussed, that can change in the blink of an eye, I'm sure other players will be available as well. If Kyle thinks, hey, nothing in house, in house is working, I got to go outside. But I think that will do it for this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. Thank you all so much for listening slash watching this one. Pat and I will be back with an episode for you all on Monday, probably in the morning. We're going to have this recap up, I would say 10.30, 11, 11.30 in the morning before noon. I think it's like that. Yeah, private. yeah. He's, he, he's excited about that. We'll recap the game against the Blues get you all set for next week's action. The Penguins are going to have some tough games coming up on their schedule. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. We'll be back with another episode for you all on Monday.